for me. A little bit louder, Bill? Or they're doing good. Excellent, excellent. Okay, all right. So what you see in front of you, um, and maybe we can have the lights. Uh, I think, are we ready for the lights, Mark? Or are you still playing too much? Okay, ready for the lights to go out. I'm gonna to talk tonight about a trip I took to Costa Rica with some friends. And as Lenny said, the Rhodes Scholar Program in February of 2023. This was a really uh, long anticipated trip for us because it was canceled twice during COVID, two years it got canceled. And we only got to go uh, this last February. This is a view uh, taken from our eco lodge in a place called Tortugueros National Park. Uh, it's a location that is only accessible via boat, a two hour boat ride or a seaplane ride. And this was just as the sun was starting to come up. Um, but I'd like to take a moment just to give you a little, just a tiny background about Costa Rica and its size. And I'm gonna to talk tonight a lot about the natural ecosystems we went to and also conservation in Costa Rica because that was a really major theme of the trip that we took. Costa Rica is about the size of the state of West Virginia. So a lot of us have a kind of a pretty good picture of West Virginia. But in that, the confines of that, there are 121 volcanic formulation formations, 5% of the world's biodiversity. So imagine this little country that has 5% of the world's biodiversity. Uh, it's estimated there are 500,000 different species of just of, um, of mammals, insects, and reptiles in Costa Rica. And there are 801 miles of coastline along both the Atlantic and the Pacific coast. So it truly is quite a, a diverse area. Um, we chose to take this trip with the group called Road Scholar. A lot of you know about Road Scholar. Basically they do learning vacations for older adults. Um, and uh, this was quite a wonderful trip and we chose it because it gave us a chance to visit five different unique ecosystems of Costa Rica in a 12 day time period. So we were moving and it was a very active trip. A disclaimer, this was not a hiking trip. So a lot of times what you'll come here to see is people climbing up mountains and doing really strenuous things. We did a lot of walking. We were very busy and pretty exhausted at the end of the day, but this was not per se a hiking trip. It was really much more a discovery trip, um, walking through natural environments, and of course, looking for some of the wildlife and plant life of Costa Rica. So I'm gonna probably put my glasses on so I can see here. Okay, so maybe I have to use this mark. Because this doesn't seem to be advancing. Okay. There we go. Oh, there we go. So we kind of can use just use this. I think it should work now. It should work now. Wasn't. Okay. Okay. Great. Right okay. Okay. Very good. So this is a map of Costa Rica, and I'm just going to give you a, a little preview of where we went. We started our trip in San Jose, which is the capital of Costa Rica. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. From San Jose, we moved on to this really wonderful, amazing place, Tortuguero National Park. From Tortuguero, we traveled inland to the Sarapiqui area, which was an upland rainforest. And from Sarapiqui, we went to Arenal Volcano area. A lot of you have heard of that. And then down to the Monteverde Cloud Forest and from Monteverde down to Carrera National Park and back then to San Jose. So I'm gonna keep this slide up just for another minute because what I wanna talk about is why Costa Rica is believed to have so much biodiversity. 
and one of the pieces of that is because of its geography. You can see here that Nicaragua borders uh, Costa Rica on the north, Panama on the south. You can't quite see the, the, the Panama sign, but it's on the south. And it sits in between two major land masses, North America and South America. And one of the beliefs is that Costa Rica was kind of a way station, that species would come from South America, they would come from North America, some stayed, some didn't, but it's right in the middle of this. In addition, it's bordered by two very different oceans, the Caribbean Sea, which is part of the Atlantic Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean. So species would come in also from those two areas. Okay, so now I should be able to do this. Okay. All right. Yes, it does. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Okay. So another reason for Costa Rica's biodiversity is really um, is, is its um, climate zones. Costa Rica has 12 different climate zones, and they're really affected by things like rainfall, prevailing winds, mountains, mountain ranges, and valleys. And because of these different climate zones, there are mangrove forests in Costa Rica, there are rainforests in Costa Rica, there are deciduous forests, and there are coastal swamps. So there are lots and lots of different types of ecosystems created by the, by the, the climate. Another is latitude. So Costa Rica, oh, sorry, came, went a little too far, but Costa Rica, and I think I missed one. There we go, there we go. This is my latitude guy. So Costa Rica is located very close to the equator. There's not a lot of climate change during the year. It tends to be a very steady climate. It's just a rainy season and dry season without a lot of variation. It's believed over millions of years that, um, when things were really bad out there in the, the other large land masses, like during the Ice Age, that a lot of species would again come to these areas where they could count on there being more climate stability. And now to my scarlet macaw. Another reason that Costa Rica has a lot of biodiversity is a much, much more recent issue. And that has to do with the conservation and protection the government of Costa Rica has offered to the environment. 70 years ago, Costa Rica decided to abolish its military and focus on three major issues for the country. Free education, public education, free health care, and protection of its environment. And Costa Rica did not always have an easy time of it. There was some pretty severe deforestation uh, caused way back to the time when the Spaniards came and did a lot of tobacco growing in the Central Valley. But because of these initiatives, Costa Rica now has over 53% of its country under forest cover. That's huge. And over 25% of the country is in, nat in preserves or national parks. They've made a real commitment to this. And the fourth thing I just wanted to talk about is a little bit about the future of Costa Rica. Uh, this gentleman here was our guide on the trip. He was a certified uh, educated government uh, licensed guide. He was wonderful. Just trying to get this mic settled. Uh, I think I can get it. Seems a little. Okay. Uh, his name was Jose Luis. He was a wonderful guide. Um, the guides in Costa Rica go through an extensive educational process and extensive licensing process. And uh, he was, as he is most of the time, he was always carrying his tripod and spotting scope. Um, there was a lot of wildlife we would have never seen without his intervention. And I would just recommend that if you like to travel independently, and some people do, that taking a day or two with a certified guide is well worth the effort and, and the cost. Um, 
he was able to identify things by sound. He was able to know where uh, the various animals and birds we were looking for were, were roosting in the trees. And he had one of these little red spotter things and would just kind of say right up there. Um, he also had a wonderful technique for helping us take photos of things through his spotting scope with our cell phone. And without him, the trip would not have been nearly as good. But what I wanted to talk about with this, this photo is the future for Costa Rica. So Costa Rica, like many countries, has um, vowed to be carbon neutral by 2050, but they're actually really doing something about it. Currently, uh, their energy production is 79% hydro, 12% geothermal, and 8% wind power. So they've really turned around some of their, some of their um, energy production. The place they are struggling, and I, I thought this was always an interesting component of the trip is Costa Rica also has a growing economy. This is really good thing for a relatively poor country. People are better educated. Uh, they're producing all kinds of goods and services. And what that creates is a lot of traffic, a lot of truck traffic, a lot of car traffic. The roads are pretty uh, inadequate for the level of traffic I saw when we were there. We were sitting in traffic jams a lot of the time. And of course, all these vehicles are gasoline producing and produce pollution. So it is an area that they're aware of and they're working on. But it's going to be a challenge to figure out how to deal with all those gasoline use utilizing uh, vehicles. So we're going to start taking off now. Now, most of us arrived in San Jose uh, International Airport in the capital city of uh, Costa Rica. There are about 600,000 people live in San Jose. So it's a relatively large city for Costa Rica. Um, we had an adjustment day the first day, so we didn't go anywhere on the bus the first day. We just stayed in San Jose, but we had some really interesting experiences. San Jose is a real mix of the modern. If you look out here, and I was standing in one place taking this shot, and then just turned my body around and took this shot. So it's the modern and the old. This is the National Theater of San Jose. It was built in the 1800s. Beautiful buildings, still very vital, has a lot of arts, uh, music, and dance performances. Um, Costa Rica, uh, San Jose was, uh, began in the 1730s when it was again the center of the Spanish tobacco growing industry in Costa Rica. So it was very, very, you know, there was a lot of agriculture in this area. Uh, there was no, there's no time difference. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question, Lisa. And we did two major activities this day. Uh, the first was we went to the pre-Columbian gold museum in downtown San Jose. Now, pre-Columbian, most of you know, that means before the time of Columbus. So generally, anything before 1500. This museum really highlights uh, the uh, artwork and particularly the gold work of the native tribes of the indigenous tribes of Costa Rica. Uh, there were no big, big tribes in Costa Rica like the Aztecs, Incas, or Mayas but there were several smaller tribes in Costa Rica. And you, you can see from their work and later their gold work, they were really fantastic artisans. Um, some of the major ones were the Barutas, the Chichas, and the Carib Caribs. So uh, I think these are fertility pieces, if I remember correctly, it certainly looks like they are. But much of the collection in this museum is gold. There are over 1,500 pieces of gold artwork in this museum from these pre-Columbian tribes. 
the museum is actually it's underground it's a subterranean building to protect it and it's owned and uh, curated by the national bank of costa rica so this is all owned by the national bank um, there was just some beautiful beautiful work there and i thought this was just a fantastic depiction of what it was believed a warrior he, he's called el guero and what a warrior would look like going into battle with his magnificent gold pieces. Um, they had a, a village there, a demonstration village, a burial plot, a lot of cool things. So we enjoyed our visit there. And we also went to um, a place called Cafe Brit. Cafe Brit is the, was the first major coffee company in Costa Rica that stopped sending its raw beans out of the country to North America, Europe, other places to be processed and marketed and said, no, we're going to do it here. We're going to create a business here to process our beans, market our beans, and they've done just that. And of course, many companies have followed. Chocolate is very similar. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but Cafe Brit uh, has done that. We went with there and had a wonderful coffee tour. This young lady took us through the whole process from seed to bush and uh, showed us how they are processing their, their, their coffee. Um, and this is, again, a, a growing kind of um, habit for companies in Costa Rica. It used to be said you could not, before 1985, not get a good cup of coffee in Costa Rica. Now you can, but the profits coming to companies are much, much better. This is just a peek into their very modern and very lovely processing plant. So it was a, quite another great way to look at what is happening in this country. And early the next morning, we took off to go to our first ecosystem. So we got on a bus for about two and a half hours. Then we got on a boat and we had two more hours till we got to our eco lodge in Tortuguero. One of the first um, new things that we saw were these big handing pendulous nests here. And I am using my only Google photo of the presentation here to show you a better, better sense of what this is. This is the Montezuma oropendula. It's a native bird to Costa Rica, mostly in the coasts and in these swampy areas. It's quite an amazing bird. It's quite beautiful. I'm gonna try this and see if this works. They have a very distinctive call. Hmm. I don't know. It's, oh, I know it's not. No, it's not working. That's my on airplane mode. That's why it's not working. Isn't that a great? It was one of the really fascinating birds that we got acquainted with. And they're, they're quite distinctive birds. Their nests are kind of like a uh, Baltimore oil nest on steroids. They're really <laughs> huge. So um, that was one part of our fun going to our eco lodge. This is a picture photo of our first eco lodge, uh, which was on the shores of this lagoon. The lagoon runs behind the beach area, uh, which, be which faces the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea. And behind there is the coastal rainforest, which uh, has myriad 
passageways and swamps, which we experienced one of the days that we were there. And this is the beach uh, area in Tortuguero. Now, Tortuguero, can anybody, I think most of you want to, anybody want to raise their hand? What does it remind you of that word, Tortuguero? Turtle, turtle, yes, it actually is, it refers to the turtles. So it was in the 1960s that an American biologist named Archie Carr studied the sea turtle nesting habitat here. He brought it to the attention of the international community and uh, it resulted in protecting this area. This is a nesting for the green sea turtle. Um, we did not go during sea turtle nesting time, which is July to September. And there is a reason we made that decision. There are kind of daily torrential rains during that period and kind of like nice weather, turtles with torrential rains, we have nice weather won out for us. But this is the, the section of the beach right next to the Sea Turtle Conservancy. You can go to Road Scholar on this trip during sea turtle nesting time. And you will then spend a lot of time out on the beach, uh, particularly at night looking for the sea turtle nesting activity, but we chose not to come that time. But the National Park, what was really interesting about this park is that it protects the beach, the sea out 30 kilometers, and then behind this strip of land, the entire lagoon area and the coastal rainforest. So the park is huge and it protects its entire environment. And this is just the lovely fence at the Sea Turtle Conservancy. Uh, oh, a termite, a termite nest. Uh, I, I don't know why this picture just kind of enthralled me, but it was kind of fun to see them. But what I wanted to address with this termite nest is they're estimated to be about 500,000 different species in Costa Rica. And of that, 300,000 are insects. So <laughs> that there are a lot of insects. I actually have, if anybody wants to come up later, I have uh, some great video on my phone, which I did not have the technical expertise to train, put on this presentation for some reason, but I can show you uh, leaf cutter ants and army ants, which were really amazing to see a, a band of army ants walking through the forest. So because we didn't uh, get to see sea turtles, our consolation prize was an afternoon with this delightful gentleman. His name was Clem. He is a life, was a lifetime uh, resident of Tortuguero, uh, right way before ecotourism started. He was a fisherman, which was the normal profession. The people in this area um, were a combination of Spanish, Mesquite Indian from Nicaragua, because the border of Nicaragua is not that far away, and Carib people. So uh, I thought in Clem, you kind of could see some of those different cultures kind of coming together in his face. He now grows coconuts, and he does programs for groups like ours where he talks about the coconut. He made us a lovely coconut snack which we ate on a leaf, which was delightful. And this is just a picture of the sleepy little village of Tortuguero. Uh, there's some touristy things about it, but it was pretty lovely and quiet. And we had a good time just exploring around. I thought a lot of it was pretty authentic. This, uh, this uh, only best uh, fried chicken uh, best place was pretty, pretty cool to see. So now we're getting out into the swamps and this was the next day. We spent the next day on both a boat ride through the swamps and, um, and a uh, boardwalk walk through the, the rainforest. Uh, this is some of our group looking at uh, another great kapok tree. I don't know if, if any of you had children around the time I had children. There was the lovely little book, The Great Kapok Tree, and talked about the life that's supported. And they really are magnificent trees. Here is a lovely sloth that we saw during our boat trip. Um, 
they're actually, I was talking to Adrian before, they're actually quite hard to spot uh, in the canopy because they blend in and they also, like monkeys, you can see them in the canopy because they're moving through the canopy and they're making noise. These guys just move so slowly. So unless you have somebody who knows where to look for them and what to look for, it's hard to see them, but we got some great shots of them. It's a beautiful bird, a yellow crowned night heron that we saw as we were going through the swamps. This is a, uh, a, a, a rusty wood rail, another beautiful bird. I love this shot because I just think the colors are great. This is a bird. He was standing in just a little bit of water. These are water plants. This is a, a purple gallinule. And then the monkeys. Um, and there were a lot of monkeys in this area. Spider monkeys. Most of us have seen spider monkeys, but it's great to see them out in the wild. Uh, they live in social groups. Uh, they're very active. They're, they can be thieves. If you're sitting by a pool and have a snack with you, uh, you better watch it because they'll come right up to it and grab it. But they're, they're amazingly agile. And this is a monkey I didn't know a lot about. This is a white-faced capuchin. Um, and uh, he, they are also live in social groups. They are opportunistic feeders, so they'll eat plants or meat, uh, meat mostly in the form of small lizards and frogs. Uh, and it's believed that they were called the capuchins because they look like the capuchin monks who were part of the Jesuit order uh, with the brown robes, the white surplice, the white face, and then the, the brown tonsure on the top. They're very curious and love to take things apart. This is a green tree boa. And lots of beautiful plant life. Uh, these are lobster claw heliconias, and we saw them everywhere through the, the rainforest here. Oh, another sloth. I can't, I, I, I could never have enough pictures of sloths. <laughs> And this guy is interesting. There are no alligators in Costa Rica, but this is a caiman. Uh, I always thought of caimans as pretty small. This guy was pretty darn big. Um, and he does he looks a little grumpy, but uh, he was kind of fun to see along the side as we were taking our boat ride. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we'll wait till you see the crocs later. I mean, <laughs> this guy was nothing. So um, I'll just stay with him for a moment. So that was the end of our time in Tortuguero. I, I think you could stay for weeks in Tortuguero and not, you know, not be tired of seeing the environment. It's really a magical place and a real treat to be able to get there. We got back in the boat, went two hours, got off the boat, got back on our bus. And we didn't have a terribly long drive, but we did have a drive to our second ecosystem. And this is the Sarapiqui area. This is more of an upland rainforest. It's not actually mountainous, but it is higher elevation. And there are different species because of that. This is, uh, Adrian went on a very, very exciting rafting trip. This was the rafting trip we went on when we were in Sarapiqui, but it was a lot of fun to be on the river. And again, unique uh, kinds of uh, mammals and reptiles. This is uh, the Jesus Christ lizard. I think a lot of you probably have seen this guy on National Geographic or Nature, the guy who kind of seems to stand up on his hind legs and walk across the water real fast like Jesus Christ allegedly did, but he was fun to see. I put this in because this gives you some sense. I think of the typical dining area of an eco lodge uh, in Costa Rica. It's open air, generally. Uh, interestingly enough, bugs sometimes were an issue when we were walking through the rainforest, but they never seemed to be an issue when we were eating. 
So I think, you know, they, they may just be when you're out in the rainforest. This was a lovely place because we could observe wildlife right with our morning coffee. The staff would put out some fruit for the birds. There was a, a lovely frog pond right by where we were, we were eating. So this is typical. And as far as Costa Rican food, I might mention that too. Road Scholar trips are often all-inclusive. Our trip did include all our meals. Um, it, um, we had one meal that wasn't included early on in the trip. Uh, it's very simple food. There's rice and beans with every meal, including breakfast. A lot of people eat rice and beans at breakfast. Um, lots of beautiful fresh fruits, lots of fresh vegetables. Meat is there, but it's not a major component of their meals. But I found the food to be very good and very satisfying. So these are some of the beautiful some of the beautiful birds we were able to observe right from our eco lodge. This is a bird called a mot mot. Uh, there are several different kinds of mot mots in Costa Rica. This is a, a brown crested mot mot. You can see they have a kind of a broad bill and a long tail that distinguishes them. Um, and they are related to the kingfisher, which we see here. Another beautiful bird, the green honey creeper. Never saw this bird before, but beautiful. These are scarlet rumped tanagers. Now we have scarlet tanagers here and they have similar coloration, but their whole rump is not, is not red. Um, the scarlet tanager we have here does migrate through Costa Rica um, and they are related to this scarlet rump tanager. And a beautiful pale-headed woodpecker. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. There were a lot of hummingbirds also. They were very difficult to get good shots out of. You know, I think a hummingbird is just something you have to appreciate in the moment a lot of times, unless you have really wonderful camera equipment, which I did not have. Most of these are, these are all taken on my iPhone. And then at night, there was a little pond where we could go to observe frog life. So this, this couple, because they are a couple, the female is the larger one on the bottom. She's about three inches long. The male on top is about two inches long. And they're either cuddling or uh, my husband suggested maybe frog porn was involved yeah. here. <laughs> but uh, I think they're, they're, um, they're involved in some kind of amorous activity. These are, the, <laughs> these are the red eyed tree frogs. Now you might ask me, where's their red eye? Well, their red eye disappears when they're at rest or you know, trying to stay private because there's a, a, a barrier that comes down that's green over the red eye. Uh, and they, they were actually incredibly well hidden. It took some, some looking to find these two. And this is what they look. And this guy was in the same pond area he was, he was just having a great time going up and down that stick uh, and kind of looks like he's waving hello. I don't think he has any intent of waving hello, but you can see his bright red eyes and their feet have, have like little suction cups on, which gives them this amazing uh, ability to get around almost anywhere. And beautiful plant life. This is a Brazilian red cloak. We saw these all over. This is a picture. It looks like a jumble, but it's a picture of a walking palm. palm. And they, biologists have documented that walking, ponds, walking palms actually do walk. Now, it's not very far, and it's over a lot of time, but they do move. Uh, what happens with the walking palms is they have kind of arms that come out from the trunk that go down and form roots. The roots always form toward the light because in the rainforest, they're trying to get toward the light. And as the roots form toward the light, 
the roots in the back that are not toward the light die off. So over time, there is this very slow movement of the walking palm toward the light. Fascinating plant. And of course, beautiful, beautiful flowers just everywhere. One of the other things we did in Sarapiqui area is we went to a cacao farm. Uh, and this is, again, a self-contained business. It's a boutique business. They grow cacao. They process it. They have a store where they sell and market it. And they do sell to the United States. Um, if you can see this, that white stuff in the middle of the cacao pod is your former chocolate bar. So that's what it looks like as it first comes out of the cacao pod before it's roasted, processed, or anything else happens to your chocolate bar. Is that tasted? You know, I have never tasted it, Lisa. I think it probably doesn't have a lot of taste. Um, and chocolate, of course, before you put, we, we taste, you, if you've had a, a low sugar chocolate bar or dark chocolate, it's pretty bitter. So I would assume it might have some bitterness, but I have not tasted it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 They led us through a whole process of what they do with their chocolate, served us hot chocolate, and all kinds of things. Um, when we were going out to see the cacao trees, we were really fortunate because, again, our guide saw these little guys who are about an inch, inch big. Uh, these are the two poison dart frogs we got to see. This is the strawberry poison dart frog. Uh, colloquially, they call him Mr. Blue Jeans, which I th think was really kind of cute. And this was the green and black poison dart frog. Uh, most poison dart frogs are very brightly colored. They're brightly colored to warn predators that not good to eat. Um, the process for getting the poison darts is they have a gland that secretes the kind of sticky substance that can be poisonous. These two are not very poisonous frogs. They have a variety of, of levels of poisonous. The golden, uh, golden poison dart frog is apparently the gold standard of poison dart frogs. Um, no, it's the, it's the, the, uh, the sticky substance that their gland secretes. And I, I have read that it's because their diet is almost completely ants and, and termites. And somehow their body processes that into something that is poisonous. Now, we've all seen those movies where the gringos are kind of coming down the river and the natives are shooting poison dart frogs and they're dying. Um, that really was not the normal <laughs> use for, for this. this. They use this for hunting small game uh, and things like that, uh, the, the poison dart frogs. But they are really beautiful, but really tiny. And the last thing we had an opportunity to do in Sarapiqui was a lot of times Road Scholar does include some type of home visit to a family. And we got to visit with Hazel and Carlos in their home. Uh, it was a very modest home, uh, but they had a large outdoor pavilion in the back of their home, which is where they did most of their living, most of their, their cooking, most of their entertaining. Uh, and we'll see that in just a moment. Um, I, love the, I love this family. I thought, you know, they reminded me a lot of my family growing up and maybe the families of many of my friends. Both Hazel and Carlos did manual labor. Hazel was actually a farmer. She had cows. She made cheese from her cow's milk. She also had gardened and made preserves from her garden. Um, so she was very, very interesting guy. Carlos did construction, but all three of their children, and you can see this, I believe is the grandparents, but here's Hazel and Carlos with their three children. 
All of them have gone to college now. Uh, we got to meet this, the youngest one who is now in college, currently studying international relations, wants to be an international business. Uh, and this is actually a piece of Hazel's artwork. So um, they, while they were, you know, humble people, they were definitely looking for their children to have a better life. And really that kind of dream was very prevalent with them. This is Hazel. Uh, she led us in an activity to show us how to and participate in making arepas. An arepa is a very typical Costa Rican small corn cake. It's made with just a uh, very fine white uh, corn flour, salt, and water. So that's all that's in it. You mix it, you roll it into a ball, and then pat it into a patty and fry it in oil. And they can be served either sweet with jam and breakfasty things or savory. They can be served with uh, meats and cheeses for dinner and lunch. And I might mention to Bethlehem residents, there is apparently a very new good arepa place over on Stefco Boulevard <laughs> that you know, I have not tried out yet, but it seems like it might be a lot of fun. And this is Hazel just with one of our group members making her first arepa. You can see the area behind their, their lovely patio, covered patio. It's pretty wild back there. And that's where Hazel's garden is. She has some amazing birds back there also. Um, the story of how the people got this land was very interesting. And I tried to piece it together the best way we could. But we were told that at one point, a very rich American owned a, a lot of this land. And I don't know if they intended to farm or what they intended to do with it, but one day they just up and left. And Hazel and Carlos, along with 25 other families, came here and I guess pretty much were kind of squatters. They came here, started living here, started working the land. I never got a straight answer about who actually owns the land now. Uh, so it was kind of a, still kind of a mystery, but, Again, I thought it's interesting how things happen differently in different countries. And they have really made a, quite a nice community here. So the next ecosystem we went to was the RNL volcano. Uh, and you can see RNL in the background. It's a great symbol of Costa Rica. It's almost a perfectly cone-shaped volcano. It's considered a young volcano at about 10,000 years. And um, it was active from 1968 to 2010, at which time it stopped um, having daily eruptions. Uh, it does still power a lot of the hot springs in the area. I did ask if we could get any closer. We had to hike up to this viewpoint where you see us standing. I asked if we could get closer. I was told no. Uh, I was asked if people climb up RNL and I was told no. So I don't know if that's the right answer or not, but I know Adrian did some hiking on volcanoes when he was in Costa Rica, but I think they had been inactive for a much longer time than RNL. And here's another view uh, from our Eco Lodge that night, from our window that night. We arrived there on a beautiful day, which was really great because. The next day, everything was sucked in, and we never saw RNL again. That was our last time. So thank God we got there and got some good pictures. But the other interesting thing we did in the RNL area was uh, a place that's been developed as kind of a tourist attraction, but a very well done one. It's called the Hanging Bridges of RNL, and it's a series of hanging suspension bridges through a rainforest area that has a lot of gorges where you can really appreciate the rainforest from the top of the rainforest to the bottom. And this is just one of the paths that are taking you down into the, into the hanging bridges area. This guy was really interesting. Um, 
This is uh, called an eyelash viper. This is one of the poisonous snakes in Costa Rica. Again, would never have seen him without our guide. You can see if I can, oops, sorry. There you go. He has um, kind of these leathery uh, things above his eyes that look a little bit like eyelashes. They are not eyelashes, it's part of his skin, but that's part of his protection. They come down over the eyes when he needs protection. They're a little snake, not very big, but it was great to see him and get a picture of him. And there were howler monkeys. Now, we had heard howler monkeys when we were at Sarapiqui. In fact, I'm going to try to play you this from my recording. So they're, they're pretty amazing. Um, I read somewhere that the howler monkey is, is probably the loudest mammal uh, because you can hear that from three miles away. I never saw those howler monkeys when we, I was sitting on my back porch of my little room at Sarapiqui, but they were there somewhere, maybe three miles away. But here we got to actually see the howler monkeys, got some nice shots of them. Sky looks very somber and very sober. Um, they are also social animals. They live in social groups. Um, their verbalizations, there are a lot of theories about what their verbalizations are. They're probably territorial. They might be about, hey, I got some good food over here. They sometimes may be about aggression and warning other social groups off. Uh, so I, I'm not sure exactly what uh, the verbalizations are about, but they're pretty amazing. This is another mot mot. Remember the mot mot we saw before? This one has very different coloration, but again has that broad beak and the long tail. This is a lessons mot mot. This is a crested quan. It's a bird about the size, I would say, of our of a small pheasant, if you would imagine that. And we didn't get a lot of really great opportunities to get shots of toucans, but this is one uh, that we got through the trees. And again, thanks to our guide, again, he spotted this little one, uh, baby toucan, up in a tree in a nest. This is a typical nesting place for a toucan, kind of in the hollow of a tree. They'll build a nest and this little guy was poking his head out, which was amazing. Again, without a guide, wouldn't have happened. There was no problem seeing these guys. These are Cotamundis. Uh, they are uh, related to raccoons. You can kind of see the resemblance. Uh, but they're not nocturnal, they're daytime animals. And wherever there was food, there were Cotamundis, especially, you know, like at the, where people were getting concessions and things, they were all over the place begging for food. So they're, they were kind of an interesting animal. And this just shows you what the hanging bridges are like. They're suspension bridges and take you throughout this whole rainforest preserve. Pretty, pretty great place to visit. And of course, we needed a little rest and relaxation. At the end of the day, we're in the hot springs at our, uh, our uh, eco lodge, along with our best new friend over there. <laughs> he didn't seem to mind being there. He just wanted to bathe with us. So on leaving our now area, we went up across the Continental Divide with our bus. Thanks to our bus driver, we were on some back roads that I wouldn't have wanted to have a car on, but uh, he did a great job getting us to this private preserve called Canto del Rio. 
Um, and I think this is another interesting story about how Costa Rica has enhanced the conservation message. So this is um, a private preserve that's owned by Edwin Ramirez and his family. 25 years ago, they got a government grant to develop this part of the cloud forest into a preserve. There were apparently a, a, a very strong rules about what they needed to do. The area suffered from both deforestation and also a lot of invasive species. So the family lived in a very humble dwelling, nothing like this. Uh, for the last 24 years, I think they only opened this house la the year before we were there, um, pulling out invasives, planting native species, clearing paths. Uh, it is right in the middle of the, the rainforest. They have a Puma, resident Puma who visits them, um, but they've developed a beautiful home. They have now built this new facility, which is where they live. They also operate a bed and breakfast out of this facility, and they also host groups like ours. So while Edwin was talking to us and then taking us for a tour on the property, his wife and daughters prepared us a fantastic lunch. So again, using kind of that, that private entrepreneur model, along with help from the government to protect some of these areas is something I think Costa Rica does really well. Um, these are some of the species we saw on, on his land. This is a, a native cor um, coral tree, some beautiful verbena. And this is a plant we saw in different other places in Costa Rica. It's called the Sangre de Cristo, the blood of Christ. Um, it's a pretty common plant throughout Costa Rica. And then it was time to leave. Um, the cloud forest and finally get to the Pacific Ocean, which was really a beautiful place to end up our time. Um, we stayed in an eco lodge that had a really extensive grounds where they, um, where they had a lot of species living, including those dang spider monkeys who were after us all the time. Um, this is uh, a common basilisk another type of lizard in Costa Rica. They had a large uh, butterfly house. This is an owl butterfly, beautiful. And they had a huge flocks of resident scarlet macaws who are noisy and raucous and beautiful. Um, scarlet macaws are apparently threatened many places. In this part of Costa Rica, however, a lot of nonprofit uh, conservation groups got together and they decided to plant teak trees and almond beech trees. And that combination includes a lot of things that are on the scarlet macaws diet and it's caused the population to really flourish in this area. Oops, sorry. One of the highlights of our visit to this area was to take a boat trip on the Tarcolis River. Croc hunting was the main, main goal here, crocodile hunting. But we saw a lot of other things. And actually one of the first things we saw was this. And I'm like, how does this fit into the whole conservation message? A big pile of tires. We remember nothing, in, nothing is perfect anywhere in Costa Rica is not perfect. And people still take their tires and they throw them in the Tarcolis River and they fall down the river. And these were a group of teenagers, most of them very nice looking young ladies, who were going in the river and pulling these tires out uh, as part of a conservation program. I thought that was pretty impressive kind of thing to do. Um, they they were. This was this was yes. Thank you, Lynn, for asking that question. They were. This was. I believe it was a government sponsored program for these teenagers. Uh, lots of bird life again. This is a bare throated tiger heron. Uh, pelicans. This is a bird I've actually never seen before. Just heard about. This is a frigate bird. These are the birds that have like the six foot wingspans and can just float along on the ocean currents in the, 
in the air for long periods of time. They're just sitting here kind of taking a rest at the moment and taking a break, but they were fun to see. We also did see them overhead, uh, but they were just little specks and didn't make a very good photo. And sorry for this pi picture. This is the best we could do. These are roseate spoonbills and they were roosting at the moment and there was no great picture of them, but I just wanted to include them because I was so excited to be able to, to see them. Yes, a roseate spoonbill is, and it's, it's a, a pink bird, long legs, you know, kind of like a, a great blue heron, but they have a bill that kind of comes out and then kind of goes into a spoon shape near the end. If you look them up on the internet, you can see them. They're a beautiful bird. And of course there was, I think we saw two crocodiles they were pretty lazy looking, uh, although I would not swim in the Tarcolis River and there were little kids swimming in the Tarcolis River and as a mom, I just wanted to say, get out of there, but they didn't seem to be afraid at all. Um, the last day before we left, I kind of climbed up um, on a hill uh, near our eco lodge. And I just thought this was a perfect parting picture of the beautiful Pacific Ocean and kind of getting ready for the end of our trip. Um, again, I have to give all the credit for this trip to these two guys. Um, on the left-hand side is our guide, Jose Luis. Um, Jose is an interesting person. He he, his parents have a large farm in the Central Valley. He and his wife and children live on the farm as do his brother and wife and children live on the farm. And they all kind of, he, his brother is also a conservation guide. They all take time together uh, to work on the farm. And then they, both the, the young men do these conservation gigs. In case you are walk, thinking of walking and really doing major hiking in Costa Rica, uh, Jose's brother leads something called the Camino de Costa Rica, where you walk across Costa Rica. Uh, I, yeah, probably pretty amazing kind of trip. Uh, so you can contract if anybody's interested, I can give you Jose's contact information because it sounds like it might be pretty amazing. Too many poisonous snakes for me, but um, it might be fun. And so Jose and the other, the other gentleman, Edwin, was our bus driver. Didn't speak a lot of English, uh, but he was very sweet, very helpful, and he got us places. I certainly don't think I could have gotten a bus. And this is our group saying goodbye as we're all heading off to the airport to catch our flights. We were a group uh, that we're, we're missing, we're missing four people. So that would have been the size of our group if we had the other four. Two canceled before they came. I'm not sure why, if it might've been a COVID related issue or something. And one of the women had kind of a, an accident that affected her back and felt she couldn't continue. And it was a very active trip. I understood why she made the choice she did. They ended up leaving the trip at a certain point. But um, we had a wonderful time uh, and I would highly recommend the trip to anybody. So if I could have lights, I think I'm ready to... Just give me a minute. I don't speak Spanish. Oh, yes. Yeah, let me just get, maybe Mark, you can do the technical stuff. <laughs> get rid of it. Yes, so um, yeah, they, Spanish is the primary language, you are correct. Um, but English is taught from grade one and I think sometimes younger. Everybody who is a young person speaks English. As I said, Hazel and Carlos, neither of them spoke any English and their son spoke beautiful English. Um, you couldn't even tell he was not a native. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a generational thing like a lot of countries are today. Um, I wanted to mention, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, 
that was really a surprise to me. Can anybody take a stab at what you think the three major exports of Costa Rica are? Bananas are one, bananas are number two. Coffee is not, coffee is an export, but it's not one of the top three. Um, no, no agriculture, no other agricultural products. Okay, I'll help you along there. So they are number one, fine medical devices. Number two, bananas, because there still is a lot of banana. We saw a lot of banana growing. Number three are prosthetics. So, you know, your prosthetic for a leg or a hand. And this has been a, a real intentional thing for the government to try to find a niche where they can bring good industry into the country to support this better educated workforce which is still very cheap on a global you know, standard, uh, but they are well-educated and they can do the work to make these technical instruments. And when you think of a prosthesis, you need to have people who are able to do that work well. Um, interestingly enough, on the plane back, I sat with a young man who was from a company in the United States and he was in Costa Rica. He worked for a medical device company and he was in Costa Rica looking, going to visit some of the factories and production facilities there. So again, I, you know, I have to say, I, I really have a, a great deal of respect for the government of Costa Rica. I think they've done a lot of things that are very visionary. And again, it's not perfect, but it's moving in a really great direction. Any other questions? We have a question about what would be the best month months to visit. Okay. As I said, uh, we chose to go in February. So I would say between December and May, if you would like good weather, it tends to be a drier time of year. Uh, that's why we chose to go at that time. Uh, the climate, the, the temperatures does not vary a lot. But from about June through September, you're going to get more and more into the rainy season where you'll have torrential rain. So again, if you want to see those sea turtles, that's the time to go. I, I talked about that a little bit. Bug spray was necessary uh, when you were walking in the forests, but we ate almost all our meals open air and I didn't really have any issue with bugs as we were eating. So I think as long as you're not having your feet in the forest area, you can be okay, you're okay. It's when you're actually in the forest. Lisa? Some of them were, some of them were marked, um, you know, Chiquita. I saw a lot of Chiquita um, and some of them weren't. So I think it kind of seemed to me to be a mix. That was mostly a drive-by kind of thing that we saw. So I don't profess to know a lot about it, but it is the second largest export. Is there a bird? You've seen this with birds. Is there a bird species you want to see? Oh, the Quetzal, yeah, and they're very rare, uh, you know, but what can I say? They're, gotta, go gotta go back, gotta go back, yeah. They're very, very hard to, to see, and, you know, everybody wants to see a Quetzal, but didn't Which happen. Just, um, I think the Quetzals are in the upland rainforest. No, no, we did not, no, did not. And again, when we were in Monteverde, uh, they have a resident puma. Of course, they're, that we were there in the daytime, which is not the time that we're gonna see a puma. And they're pretty, they're all pretty reclusive, all the cats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you get to see a cat? No, <laughs> okay. Did anybody who's been to Costa Rica get to see a big cat? No, and they are there, you know, they are there, but they're pretty hard to see. 
Any other questions, Bill, from the group, the group online? Okay. Thank you all. And, and of course, Bill could not be here this evening, but he did make sure before he left, Bill is a potter and this is